and good evening, good whatever time of day it is, and my table is collapsing here, but I think it's going to be okay. Uh, I'm so glad this evening uh, that my guest is here who's been on a number of times before, and he will be on a number of times in the future, uh, Dr. Martin Donahoe, who is a friend and a great thinker and all sorts of other good things I can say about him without going overboard. He's a fine gentleman and a marvelous MD and a, a whole bunch of other stuff he'll tell you about as we talk about who he is personally for a few minutes before we go into the main topic of the show, the obesity epidemic, and why it is you, uh, you've arrived at uh, agreeing to that term that there is an ob obesity epidemic. And I'm not as nervous as I usually am because I just had two slices of pizza before you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you, Dr. Donahoe? I'm great. It's been too long. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be long. back. And, and thank you, Mom, for writing that introduction for Dr. Donahoe. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's going to be that kind of evening. <laughs> yeah, so uh, say a few words about who you are personally and what you're about nowadays in, in your, your, your business and whatever. Yeah, outside of uh, practicing medicine and working on my book, which I should pitch later in the show, or my editor will be upset. Uh, I've been spending a lot of my time, oh, ranting against the racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, homophobic, uh, science-denying, flat-earth, uh, climate change, refuting, ecocidal, corporate kleptocrats that are trying to run our species and planet into the ground. This is a family show, and, Martin. And taking my niece and nephew to the pool. <laughs> and taking your nieces and nephews <laughs> to the pool. That's good. You enjoy the pool? I love it. We've gone canoeing, too. They're, they're, they love the water. And you look so healthy. What are you doing for yourself that keeps you so healthy looking? I'd, I'd like to say it's good living, but I'd be lying. So I, this is actually a hologram, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the real me looks much worse. Ellery, let's stop and start this show all over again. <laughs> Ellery is my wonderful director I've had for many, many years. Thank you, Mr. E. So, and uh, say a few more words about you, your private practice as an MD, and then you teach too, and say some more. So I do. I, I practice part-time as uh, hospitals taking care of patients who are in the hospital or admitted through the emergency room. And I teach an occasional course at Portland State. I've done... Uh, teaching in the past on a variety of subjects from public health and social justice, which is the name of my website, which is where, by the way, you can find all of my publications and open access PowerPoints, meaning you can freely use them for your own edification. If you have to give a lecture to anything from a group of high school kids to grad students to the key club, uh, they're all free and open access, and that's publichealthandsocialjustice.org or phsj.org. Put that up, www.phsj.org. Yeah, a lot of good stuff there. And, and traveling the country, giving talks here and there, and, and generally enjoying life. Traveling the country, what, what does that mean? The south, east coast, the midwest, or what? All over. All over. Yeah, some of it's invited talks, some of it's um, national meetings of professional societies where I meet with like-minded individuals and we um, talk amongst ourselves <laughs> and then figure out the best way to get the message out to everybody else. There's other people in America who think and talk like you? Oh, there's lots. We're going down the tubes. <laughs> no, we're not. I... Thank, thank God for you. <laughs> so you're enjoying that? I am. Yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate. Uh -huh. So if you don't sit still long enough, how is some woman going to uh, uh, trap you and marry you? By the way, uh, Dr. Donahoe is single, ladies, okay, so. And, and, and this is the best it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you've been pretty busy and your life is pretty full with all that you do, huh? Uh-huh. And how is it you choose to talk about obesity? Well, I think this flows from our last show where we talked about food justice and um, everything from hunger in America to in the developing world to how the food system is set up to why food aid is often misappropriated and to how corporations corrupt the agricultural process. And so I figured the next step in this, in which we hopefully will address to some extent the role of corporations in promoting the uh, obesity epidemic is also um, comes out of the fact that so many of the patients that I see that are hospitalized now are there 
with illnesses that arise out of their obesity. And um, there tends to be a culture of blame of individuals who are obese that they're solely responsible for their state. Now, there is an argument to be said that things like diet and exercise are um, self-regulated. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are also many arguments, however, show that the way our society is set up is such that it nudges us, pushes us towards making unhealthy food choices. And those unhealthy food choices and those unhealthy choices that were led to, um, often without even realizing it, uh, make us basically a bigger nation. And that's not good for us. It's not good for our economy. And even, ironically, it's not good for our military. I found out the other day that one in 20 military recruits are rejected because of a criminal background. Uh, one in three are rejected because they're not physically fit enough. Wow. You see, a, a culture in our country that encourages the kind of thing like obesity, what do we need to do about the culture? Well, can I first give some definitions Please just so we're do. all on the same page yes. of what we mean by overweight and by obesity? Um, there are many ways to calculate this. One of the most common is the body mass index, which is the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. It's a little complicated. There's ways you can do this online. Um, basically, anything between 25 and 30 is usually considered overweight, and above 30 is obese, and above 40 is morbidly obese. And the higher you go up, uh, the worse the health consequences. But, Can you put that into, uh, into pounds, things that you have? Well, it depends, it depends on one's height, and it also depends on one's body type, too. Okay. That's why it's not a perfect measure of obesity. But it's also one of those things like uh, the Supreme Court Justice, I think it was Potter Stewart, said it's like pornography. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And if you look historically, this, this is an epidemic, because if you were to just go back to 1950, only a quarter of Americans were either overweight or obese. Um, today, you're talking two-thirds. And one-third of Americans are overweight, one-third are obese. Um, and interestingly, 20-plus uh, percent of pets in the United States are obese. What? Say that again? Pets. 20 percent of pets are obese. And obese pets tend to have obese masters. So that's really contagious, isn't uh, it? It's, it is. It, it's a it, species. It almost is something that spreads like a virus, uh, like the flu, um, and it, it has myriad causes. So probably before we talk about what we can do about it, we might want to discuss how we get how we get there. Okay. That, that I'll take it away. So, yeah. Um, the first and foremost cause would be diet, of course, what we put into our mouth, the calories that we take in. And there uh, is an ideal diet. You should have about 50, 55 percent carbohydrates, uh, about um, 25 percent um, protein, and the rest should be fats. And ideally, the type of fat should be the good sort of fat, so the olive oil, a kind of Mediterranean type diet, not the trans fats that many cities are fortunately moving to get rid of in restaurants because those are the very un heart unhealthy fats. Uh, the second contributor is exercise. And unfortunately, many kids in our public schools today are not getting enough exercise. Part of the cause of that is television. Um, kids are spending an average now of about four hours a day on TV and another four to six hours on other types of media, be it cell phones or tablets or whatnot. And between the ages of two and seven, 25 percent of those kids have a TV in their own room. Uh, and when you get to the eight to 18 range, you're talking probably about two-thirds of, of individuals have a television set in their own room. So, What about people who say that it's good for kids to have more information than the television in their room and uh, spending that much, that, that much time in front of the television is good for them? What well, there's, there's not people? much parental control over what's going on when you've got a six-year-old sitting watching TV in their bedroom. They may not necessarily watch educational programming. There, there are some educational programs that are worthwhile. Um, kids are also exposed in many of their schools to Channel One, which is basically corporate-driven propaganda. Um, and 
we can save that for another <laughs> program. Um, but, but exercise is important, and um, gym classes tend to get cut um, when school budgets get cut. Uh, there are many neighborhoods that unfortunately are not very safe, and if you go to certain neighborhoods, those that are racked in poverty, um, they tend to have much fewer parkland, much fewer open space um, in which kids can actually go out and play, where there's not the basketball courts, there's not the fields where they can go play soccer, um, and so exercise is important. Sleep is also very important. Um, poor sleep is associated with being overweight. Really? Um, night shift work, which I do a lot of, is also associated with being overweight. But you're not overweight. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 I'm here. not. No. <laughs> <laughs> that goes out to the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> you're bad. There are other contributors, though. Um, we're finding out more and more that genes play a role. Mm -hmm. that hormones play a role, things like leptin and ghrelin, which are recently discovered hormones, that chemicals in our environment, um, BPA, which they're taking mm. out of baby bottles, um, uh, phthalates, which are endocrine disruptors, yes. which are found in many products that are on the market, also uh, have uh, hormonal properties that promote obesity. Um, there's exciting research going on on what's called the microbiome, which are basically that set of organisms, primarily bacteria and viruses, that live on and within us, and the role that they play in promoting how we metabolize foodstuffs. Uh, so the interplay between us and, and the other species on our planet, we're finding for a number of diseases, is becoming more and more relevant. Certain diseases are associated with obesity. Um, people who have low thyroid hormone production or hypothyroidism can be obese. Um, there are certain medications that can contribute to obesity. Um, some oral contraceptive pills will contribute to weight gain. Um, not all, um, and it's different for different patients. Um, some of the older classes of antidepressants, some of the anti-schizophrenia um, drugs mm -hmm. contribute to obesity. Uh, and interestingly, your birth weight plays a role. And those who have very high birth weight, and this can often happen to obese parents or parents who are moms who are diabetic, uh, will often give uh, birth to large for gestational age infants. Um, but also those who are born very small uh, are also at risk for obesity. And part really? of this is part of this, I think, is physiological. It, it has to do with sort of a catch-up and a survival, uh, an automated survival instinct to take in as many calories as you can. Um, so those are some of the major contributors. All right. What are the health and economic consequences of obesity? The health and economic consequences of In obesity. this country alone, it's estimated that about 300,000 deaths per year are consequent to obesity. Now, to put that, to compare that, uh, for tobacco, you're talking about 400,000 people dying directly from the effects of tobacco and another 50,000 dying from the effects of environmental or secondhand tobacco smoke. Um, so the next biggest killer in America after tobacco is obesity. Uh, in terms of costs, if you include the medical costs and the lost productivity, uh, you're talking almost $350 billion. And to take care of an obese patient's health needs over a one-year period versus uh, the same age-matched patient of average weight costs about an extra $1,500. Occasionally, I'll, I'll, I'll blurt out and repeat something you just said because I thought I was pretty up on things important as that, but some of the things you're saying are just, I'm, I'm not up on, they're just shocking. Like that, that, that percentage of people who are obese in the population, I didn't think about that. I didn't think it was that high. Well, it, it, it's fascinating to me because I've been um, practicing for about 20 years now. And I remember when I was in training, we had for a very large hospital about the size of OHSU, uh, two extra large beds. Our called, Health Sciences University here in Portland. Right. They were called big boy beds, and they were for folks who are morbidly obese. Uh, and we had two wheelchairs for a hospital 
of that would that would house hundreds of patients. Two wheelchairs that were wide sized. Now all, essentially all wheelchairs are wide sized um, because so many patients require them. And it was extremely um, rare for me as an intern and a resident and even a fellow to have to um, get somebody's assistance to move a patient in bed so that I could look underneath them basically to look at bed sores and make sure that there was nothing wrong with their spine. And um, today, because of the number of patients that we're seeing that are obese, it often requires getting a nurse or two into the room to help me. And I feel very badly for this patient because I think it is awful to live inside a body um, that suffers from really severe obesity. Um, and so, uh, again, I don't want this to be a function or my visit here and what I'm saying to, to be misinterpreted as a, a situation where I'm blaming the patient. I think there are, again, myriad factors that contribute to this and a lot that I and others as public health professionals can do a great deal about. And unfortunately, though, there's lot, a lot of ignorance surrounding the sub and a lot of resistance to any kind of governmental interference that gets between me and my stake. Uh, but <laughs> isn't there some other interference going on in, in uh, the food and what I put in my mouth and my obesity? There are other influences that you'll be talking about, won't you? Yeah, I, I hope to spend some time on fast foods and uh, because that, that's a fascinating phenomenon. And I grew up in Southern California where Ray Kroc and the rise of McDonald's and Carl's Jr. And as, as a kid, it was a big treat to go to McDonald's. And yeah. granted, I ate well. My, my parents were amazing cooks. Um, but for some reason, we just got suckered in and we'd, we'd twist their arms hard enough. And sometimes we'd want to go and we'd want to go play in the Ronald McDonald playground that was right outside the restaurant. So that was the draw uh, or the toys that they were offering or the tie-ins with the movies that had come out that we saw and free glasses with characters on them. And it was all very exciting. And there were other kids there. And it was, it was the social scene when you're seven and eight. So the difference from 20 years ago and nowadays on the incidence of, of uh, obese people in hospitals and requiring the bigger wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. You've seen that dramatic a difference. Oh yeah, in fact, there's a, there's a huge plus size market for a variety of items from for office furniture to clothes to uh, cars that are specially outfitted. Um, and it's a, it's a hot area of investment. Um, so I would say if, if, um, if you have stock in uh, say Archer's Daniel Midland producing high fructose corn syrup and you want to get a little profit on the other end also from those who are ingesting the high fructose corn syrup that I would advise you to invest heavily in the obesity products market and you'll, you'll do especially well. <laughs> Double down. And I hear that cynical. Yes. Um, so th can we talk a little about the health consequences? Um, Please do. Because that's what yes. I feel very passionately about, and I, I see the suffering that's consequent to obesity um, that's quite severe. So there, as you can imagine, are many. And some of them, your viewers, of course, will be familiar with things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, especially type 2, which is the adult onset diabetes. And in fact, many people are not calling that adult onset anymore because we're seeing what used to be known as adult onset diabetes in children, and sometimes children as young as eight to 10. Eight to 10. Yeah, and so uh, higher rates of coronary artery disease, which causes heart attacks, um, gallstones, uh, reflux disease or heartburn, worse asthma. So if you have asthma, your asthma attacks are gonna be more frequent uh, and more severe higher rates of blood clots, and blood clots in the legs can sometimes break off, travel through the heart to the lungs and kill you, so it's a, it's a big problem. Um, higher rates of incontinence, uh, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, fertility problems, uh, both for men and for women, problems with wound healing, taking longer to get out of the hospital after surgery, more likely to have a wound infection, um, more likely to develop arthritis. Basically, you're putting a much greater stress on your hip joints and your knee joints, and they're gonna suffer the wear and tear over time. Um, higher rates of gout, 
higher rates of depression, higher rates of dementia. And in fact, there are studies that correlate ingestion of fast food with Alzheimer's disease. And then one of the big ones- Good that, studies that correlate that. Yes, yes. I, I, all of this, there, there uh, are a plethora of studies published in the medical and public health and nursing literature over the last few decades um, that not only look at associations, uh, immediate associations, but follow individuals over time mm -hmm. and look at what their outcomes are. And unfortunately, those who are obese, and the more obese you are, the worse it is, you're more likely to suffer from a lower quality of life, uh, you're more likely to die an early death, and you'll suffer the unfortunate stigmatization that society uh, imposes on those who are obese. You're going to talk about somewhere in this R why people are obese now as compared to 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You'll talk about why. And hopefully you'll talk about what those people can do about their obesity. Yeah, yeah. Bef before we come to that, I want to mention a couple other things. One is a disease that I'm seeing a lot that unfortunately is not often recognized by the general public, so I'd like to get the message out there, and that's called sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and it's an illness that usually occurs in people who are overweight. Um, these are people who often snore at night, and in addition to snoring, have episodes of apnea, which basically means stopping breathing. And when that occurs, it's not enough to wake them up, but it's enough to bring them from those deep restorative phases of sleep into the phases of sleep that don't provide the rejuvenation that we might feel the next morning after we wake up after a good eight hours of sleep. And yeah. so what happens during those spells is because you're not breathing, you're basically not getting any oxygen to your brain, any oxygen to your heart, and individuals with sleep apnea thus have higher rates of a number of things from heart attacks, heart failure, heart rhythm problems, sudden death from heart arrhythmias, strokes, early dementia because you're just basically picking off brain cells every time this happens. Some oxygen deprivation. Depression. They're fatigued during the day. Um, they never feel like they have any energy. Often at night they might sleep in a chair. Uh, because they can't lie flat because when they do they find it's too hard to breathe. But this is a treatable disease and it's easily tested for in a sleep lab and the treatment is that you wear a special mask that basically continuously blows air into your nose, mouth, airway um, and it probably takes a little bit of getting used to. My sense from my patients is that there sometimes can be minor problems with fitting and you might feel a little dried out so you need to use some moisturizing uh, in your nose. But after a few weeks or so on it, people are getting a much better sleep, they have energy, their sex lives are better, um, and you can actually turn around some of these illnesses. So you're talking about treating a symptom rather than the cause of the symptom well, of sleep apnea. Well, the cause is, is obesity in the sense that if you lose weight, you can get rid of your sleep apnea. I'm, I'm um, oversimplifying a bit. There are people who, with retrognathous jaws, jaws that are, have severe underbites, I can't even do it myself, um, who have this, and there are others who are not necessarily obese who have the problem. But losing weight certainly is one cure for the sleep apnea. But in the meantime, uh, it's important to treat the manifestations uh, and try to prevent of those course. consequences, which really, mm. can, really can destroy your quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, the one other thing I thought was important to mention is um, obesity in young people, particularly young women. Um, teenagers who are obese uh, have been found to display uh, much more risky sexual behaviors they're less likely to use contraceptives. Uh, when they do use contraceptives, the contraceptives are not necessarily as effective. Uh, they're more likely to have un unwanted pregnancies and thus um, more likely to undergo abortions. Um, and they have more complications of pregnancy and their children don't do as well. As a result of obesity. Well, as an association with obesity, okay, an association. and there, there are a number of other associations that go with that that relate to things like level of education, level of poverty, um, living situation, uh, and 
you mentioned earlier um, when we were talking the fact that many people who are poor are obese. Mm -hmm. And that struck me as odd when I first heard that because I thought, well, less money, you can't spend it on food. So I would think, if anything, those who are poor and because they constitute a larger percentage of the poor than Caucasians, uh, African Americans, um, Native Americans, Latinos and Latinas in America um, would be less obese. But the fact is that they have higher rates of obesity. And much of this is due to the fact that they live in food deserts, um, places where fruit and vegetables are not as available. Um, where there's not as many supermarkets. They can't go and join necessarily a community-supported agriculture co-op uh, where the parents who are responsible for feeding the children, and it's often the mothers, might be working two jobs. And the easiest and fastest way to feed your kids is to get them calorie-dense food that's handed to you right behind the wheel of your car. Mm -hmm. And the fast food companies know this, and they locate themselves deliberately in those sorts of neighborhoods because it's a cheap form of calorie-dense food. And so that's what's called the obesity paradox, is that poor people are more obese than the wealthy, who you imagine could be stuffing themselves with truffles and wafer thin mints to finish things off. What about... Uh, the uh, idea, the, the thought that uh, a lot of obese people are, are obese because this is their way of getting strokes or recognition or some sense of importance or some satisfaction. They're getting pleasure out of their taste buds rather than human-to-human -human interaction or connection. I, I think that's a very good point. It's one of the reasons that we see an association of obesity with depression and anxiety disorders and schizophrenia is that for many, and this I think is true of substance abuse also, your form of contact um, with pleasure, your, your form of pleasure is through eating. And sitting down and having a good rich meal is, is very wonderful. And, and I'll relate, if I may, just a personal anecdote Please do. That, that's somewhat related vis-a-vis um, -vis drug abuse. Now, um, I'm a clean living guy. And that's not just because you're Let's watching, you're Mom. Never, never mind. No, I've never even smoked so much as a cigarette. Um, just because I, I, was, I was athletic when I was young and, and, and uh, just didn't want to put that stuff in my body. Mm -hmm. But I had surgery when I was in medical school. And I had a little, I'm divulging my medical history on um, national television. Do it, I yeah. dare you. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be forever on the Internet. So I, I had a cyst taken off the base of my spine. Uh, and was hospitalized at the same place I was in medical school. And after the operation, I got some Demerol, which is a synthetic narcotic. Ooh. And um, it was good. It was really good. The pain was there, and I didn't really care. It kind of took the pain away. Mm -hmm. And I was hospitalized, because this was the days when people got hospitalized interminably uh, for yes. minor conditions. I was hospitalized for a couple of days, and every four hours I was asking for the Demerol, because I really, really enjoyed it. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah. And when I was ready to go home, they wanted to give me a big bottle of Vicodin, because they thought I had a very low pain threshold, and I just declined. And I said, I've, I've got a test in two days I've got to study for. And, um, but it, it gave me an appreciation, and I was taking a lot of care of a lot of vets when I was in medical school, and um, in my career I've taken care of a lot of homeless people and people who have substance abuse problems. And I can totally understand when you lack the familial support and the friends that, that I was lucky enough to have, and um, you don't have the opportunities that I have, and maybe you've been in the military and seen horrible things happen, that your escape can be drugs, and, and I can understand where that comes from. Yeah. And that, I think, relates to what you said about food, that I can see where that comes from for many people. The psychological stalking. Now, uh, let's take a break for a few minutes and uh, let my director uh, not get so mad at me for going too long without a break. Let's do that now, please.
suggestions for taking care of obesity. We're, we're just chattering away here without the cameras being on us. But anyhow, we are back. Let's resume again, Martin, okay? Where did we leave off? And well, please don't take my last comments as a um, endorsement of narcotic abuse because believe me, I see the dark side of it all the time and it's awful. It, it is really awful. It rips apart families. It causes people to die young and undergo tremendous suffering. So, um, but I, I do relate to that. Um, you, I, you want to talk a little bit about um, the other ends of the spectrum. It might be important to mention before we get into the treatments, um, the pathological underweight end of the spectrum and the fact that there are many people who have issues keeping on weight, people who are afflicted by anorexia or bulimia, but also many people who have distorted body image. And this is a big problem in teens. Mm -hmm. If you ask high school um, girls if they think they're overweight or what's their number one wish, most of them will say they're overweight. Uh, most of them say that the number one thing that they wish for is to be more thin. That's my, more my field as a clinical psychologist than as, as a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. But you're so all over the place with your research and your work. I'm sure you, you know quite a bit about that too, and the causes of it. Yeah, you know, there's body a, dysmorphic. What do you call I think it? body dysmorphic disorder. I think there's, there's a, a real misperception that's promulgated by the media as to what a normal body type is. Because the average body size in the United States for men is five foot nine, 191 pounds. And the average for women is five foot four, 163 pounds. You're kidding me. I didn't, I'm, so, I'm embarrassed. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and Whose literature is that? The AMA or what? Oh, no, it's just, it's just population wide studies of what the average height and weight are of Americans. Now, of course, the models that you see on TV and the people that you see in TV shows, and there's not a lot of obese characters in TV shows, and when they are, they're usually sort of the buffoons of jokes and, and the yeah. ones that are not in the romantic relationships and so on. Um, but the models that you see on TV are, are much smaller. And in fact, the dolls our little kids play with are so distorted that the, the, um, the waist on a Barbie, were it on a true human being, um, you would just look freakish. I would look like a dumbbell with just a, something yeah, very yeah. small in the center. Same thing with the Ken doll. He's a little more normally proportioned, but um, not quite. So people are conditioned to this is what you should look like. And if you don't look like this, then there's something wrong then with you. there's something wrong with and you. And you're fat. Yeah, and then you turn to dangerous solutions. And so kids will take uh, unregulated supplements. And the Food and Drug Administration has no law that really says that when you buy an herbal supplement or a nutraceutical supplement, that what you're getting in the bottle is what it says on the label. So there's no control for purity, for composition, for contaminants for actual dosing. A uh, truth of the results. And many of these products are dangerous and end up being taken off the market because they're stimulants of variety, uh, a variety of types and can cause seizures and high blood pressure and in awful cases, heart attacks and strokes. So um, kids will resort to those. They'll resort to um, laxatives. Um, they'll resort to uh, abnormal uh, eating behaviors, throwing up, um, bulimia. Uh, bulimia, exactly. So, uh, and, and this has consequences, severe eating disorders, dental problems to begin with, problems with menstruation and fertility, depression, infections, um, and ultimately stunted growth because you're not getting adequate nutrition. Um, so that's the other end of the continuum. Well, then there's, there's another extreme end that's way beyond obesity. There can't be. There is. There's, there's gluttony. And we're talking there about uh, people who are involved in, say, the International Federation of Competitor, Competitive Eating. Yes. And they have a publication called The Gurgitator. No kidding. No. And um, they promote these eating contests like you've probably seen the famous Nathan's annual hot dog eating contest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The guy that won this year, he's won five years in a row. How many hot dogs do you think he ate in 10 minutes? I won't guess. But most of these competitors are not obese, are they? Are they? No, but that's, that's I, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. You would think that they would be obese, but actually what these folks do is they stretch their stomachs. So whereas one might 
intuitively think, oh, if I'm going in an eating contest, and I, now I'm going to be giving advice to people on how to enter an eating contest, which I don't want to do, but it, it's worth explaining, I suppose. Um, the days before, what they'll actually do is eat a lot because the goal is to stretch your stomach as much as you can. Um, it's not to fast and wait because if you fast and you try to throw a lot of food in your stomach, you'll feel full very quickly. Uh -huh. um, and so the guy who did it this year, uh, 68 hot dogs in 10 minutes. And I mean, this, this is just disgusting. And you must, I, I shudder to think what someone who is living in sub-Saharan Africa in dire poverty, uh, living part of the developing world where as many people die of hunger-related causes in two days as died during the atomic bombing at Hiroshima. I shudder what they must think about us when they see us doing this with food and people cheering about it and cheering them on and seeing this on the news. It, it just, uh, it makes, it, it, well, it turns my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's the other end of the spectrum. So shall I ask you your next question? You had some more thoughts that you were going to tell me, or share with me, without my going to this oh. cheat sheet of questions. Well, I think the whole issue of, of um, marketing is very interesting. Um, kids in America see about 40,000 ads for food-related products a year. A lot of this is on Saturday morning cartoons, but it's also through apps that they can play with on an iPhone. Um, it's in the store, it's on billboards. Uh, and about three quarters of those ads that they see are for junk food or fast food. Three quarters. And this is deliberate predatory marketing of fast food corporations to young children knowing that they influence billions of dollars worth of spending by their parents. And so as much as you might say, well, it's their parents' responsibility not to take them to these restaurants, and to a degree that's true, it's very hard to always resist the arm twisting of your child whose friends are all going to be going to McDonald's and wants to go with them because they're going to get a free Happy Meal with this kind of toy in it or that kind of toy in it. Um, plus, they're seeing it on the Saturday morning cartoons, and there's tie-ins with the movies, and, oh, I just the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie is out, and I can get a free tiny Power, Mighty Mower, whatever, doll. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, that's why you see a lot of um, fast food um, companies, well, all of them spending enormous amounts of money. And I must say, and I'm ashamed of this, a recent study found that 42% of 250 academic medical centers in the United States that they studied, 42% had fast food restaurants inside the hospital. In the, uh, <laughs> so, so it shows uh, the power of corporations. It, 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 well, that and, and the, the stupidity of hospital administrators to allow this, I suppose. Um, and now, on the other hand, there are positive initiatives going on, including one right here in Portland, um, and that's Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Hospitals Initiative, that are trying to green hospital cafeterias and take advantage of having a captive audience of sick people and their relatives so that we can serve them good food and, by example, teach them the way to stay out of the hospital. It's, it's, it's a funny business I'm in. I mean, really, I would like to put myself out of business entirely um, and, and would hope that our policymakers would assist me. Um, but they don't always. But uh, your profession is somehow or other uh, hooked up with or connected to the fast food industry and the corporations who make money off of the symptoms caused by obesity. Well, and, and groups, the American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians have all partnered with junk food marketers to promote websites, to fund research, uh, to sponsor chairs uh, and faculty um, faculty positions at universities, often in, ironically, obesity studies. Um, and that's, that's what we're battling against. Um, the soda industry, too, is incredibly powerful in this country. Um, teenagers and tweenagers in the United States get 20 to 25 percent of their calories from sodas. 
And sure. uh, when I was a kid, it was a big deal. You'd go into 7-Eleven, and, and so I remember they came out with the Big Gulp, and we just thought nobody could ever drink one of those things. And now they have the Super Big Gulp, and I'm not sure what's next, the Armageddon Big Gulp, but um, it's... It, it's um, it's a sign, I think, of the times. Um, but we spend about a hundred billion dollars per year in the United States on fast food, and in fact, a third of Americans' calories are from fast food, and half of our food budgets go to the purchase of fast food. There are ways to make healthier choices and healthier, inexpensive choices, um, and I think one of the ways of as individuals in a society fighting the obesity epidemic is helping people and are on our own making those healthy food choices. How about obesity in other countries compared to obesity in, in the U.S.? Well, it's becoming a problem and um, the number of obese people worldwide now equals the number of people who suffer from famine and food insecurity. It's about 1.1 billion on each end. Uh -huh. And part of that is the export of Western culture. It's the fact that you can go into places and uh, you might, uh, it, this reminds me of a story, a, a colleague of mine, and this was 20 years ago, he was going to do some work in sub-Saharan Africa with the poor and provide health care. And he was an internist like I am, so we know a lot about really weird diseases and diagnosis, and much of our job involves lab tests and CAT scans and MRI machines that they don't have at all in that part of the world. Um, and he went there and he spent about a year and he said, you know, Martin, if you really want to make a difference, learn how to drive a truck. Because he said, you go anywhere and you'll see Coke machines because they got the trucks to distribute them. And so if you want to get the message out, learn how to drive a truck, you can deliver vaccines or something like that. In sub-Saharan Africa, there are trucks yeah, that deliver you Coke. Can, you can find them everywhere. Instead of medications and food. Well, often. Yeah, unfortunately, and, and Coke and Pepsi are involved in bottled water, which is tremendously damaging to the environment. Um, and, and ironically, much bottled water is just tap water that's slightly reprocessed, put back in plastic, which is not good for us or the environment, especially when it's thrown away and ends up in the Pacific Ocean's gyre of unwanted, discarded plastic, which affects sea life and so on. I'm really rambling here. But they're involved in the bottled water industry, and in fact, um, in um, the bottling plants that Coke was using in Guatemala, they were hiring paramilitary thugs to keep out organized labor. And Coke has also gotten into trouble in India, um, basically with contamination of Coke and of their water product, which is Dasani. Pepsi is Aquafina, Coke is Dasani, um, because they were finding heavy metals and, and high levels of pesticides in the water, in the water and in the soda. But these things are insignificant compared to what we're doing is modernizing these countries and bringing them into the 21st century. Well, much modernization is not necessarily good. In fact, when uh, immigrants come to the United States from countries where they have a very healthy diet, say Japan, uh, within a generation they've adopted our eating practices and, and countries where there's very low rates of obesity, those who have that cultural heritage who move here become obese, their children become obese, and they adopt a Western lifestyle that also carries a tremendous carbon footprint um, and contributes to global warming. More mass, more body to feed, more calories, more farmland, more depletion of soil, more depletion of water, uh, more pollution created more warming of the planet, and that at a time when population is growing exponentially is clearly not a sustainable pattern for life on Earth. Okay, I'm aware of our time winding down, but I wanted to talk a little bit about more about what we can do as a society, as individuals, about the obesity problem in our country. That's great. So as individuals, there are certain things that one can do, um, and there are a number of diets out there. The data on which ones work or don't work are pretty sparse outside of one looking at Weight Watchers. Um, really what you want to do is eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. All shapes, all sizes, all colors. Grains are good. Seafood, good. The top predators, your swordfish, your tilefish, your shark, have a lot of mercury because of coal-fired power plants that 
spew it into the environment. But that so, doesn't cause obesity, mercury doesn't. No, but in, if you want to get a healthy diet, you do want to eat a lot of seafood, but not much of those top predators. And there are places no. like the Monterey Bay Aquarium's website and others where you can find the list of safe seafood. Um, chicken, meat, if you like them, I think it's fine to eat them in moderation. I would take the skin off the chicken. I would cut all the fat off the meat. The skin is what's tasty when you put the seasoning on it. My goodness. Mm. <laughs> That's just going straight to your arteries and lining those pipes with crud that ultimately is going to close off. Um, exercise. And it's difficult to get exercise. Um, time constraints. Uh, but you have to start. Um, and don't expect a lot of weight loss. If you can lose a pound a week or even every two weeks over the course of a year, that's anywhere from 25 to 50 pounds, you can make a huge difference. When you're going down to sit down for a meal, have one or two glasses of water first because they'll stretch the stomach, they'll make you feel somewhat full to begin with, you'll eat less. Well, the more hungry I feel when I'm eating, the better it's going to taste. What are you talking about <laughs> drinking water ahead of time? And eat slowly because the chemicals that go from your gut to your brain to say, hey brain, I'm full, take about 20 minutes to really make their transition there. So if you keep eating, thinking, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, suddenly it's going to hit you 20 minutes. If you eat more slowly, you'll feel hungry quicker. Put less on your plate. Go back for seconds. Make it an effort to do it if you have to. Get more sleep. Um, build a support network of other people that want to work with you. There are certain medications that are out. Um, Orlistat or Xenical is on the market. You could lose a few kilograms. There's side effects. Meridia is a drug they took off the market. Uh, Fen Fen was taken off the market for heart valve problems. I'm not a fan, really, of these supplements. Um, I do think that there is a role for surgery, though. We have a problem, Martin. You're bringing in now the pharmaceutical industry and big pharma in order to have people give up obesity to take drugs to combat it. I think there are other things that we should address here behaviors other than drugs. Oh, absolutely. I mean, behaviors and, and really establishing patterns that you can sustain because you don't want to lose the weight and gain it right back. Um, gastric bypass, gastric banding, other pr That's surgical radical, procedures. Yeah. It's radical, but for those who are severely obese, who are committed to losing weight, who've shown that they can lose some weight on their own, the results can be quite dramatic. And we're talking about reversal of diabetes and heart disease and hypertension and high cholesterol in upwards of 70 percent of patients in some studies. So very dramatic results. Um, and then there's a number of public health measures that we can take. Um, and that would be offering wiser choices in school cafeterias, hospital cafeterias, putting the vegetables at the front, making it harder to get the bad stuff, nudging people towards the right decisions. Simple as that. Huh? It's as simple as that and people will make the right choices. Uh, meatless Mondays. Um, having areas where people can go and enjoy parkland, can get exercise, organized exercise, join a gym, join a health club, take ballroom dancing, go for a walk. Any kind of exercise is good just to get your heart rate up. I don't care if you're playing tennis, you're walking, you're biking, it's all good. How about arranging your life with people you're, you're associated with, your loved ones, your mates, such that it's less stressful so you'll be less inclined Absolutely. to satisfy yourself through your mouth? It's teamwork. It's like quitting smoking. If one spouse quits and the other doesn't, it's going to be hard to maintain that abstinence. Um, insurance. We've got about five minutes left, so you wanted some time to talk about your book? Yeah, let me say a few p more public health things and I'll rip through them. Um, All right, sure. Some insurance companies have both incentives to lose weight, um, they'll give you money or lower rates if you join a health club or if you lose weight. Some have disincentives, you pay a higher rate if you're mm -hmm. overweight. Um, menu labeling. People choose items on the menu for a meal that are about 100 calories less when they know how many calories that they're getting. And New York and other places have found this to be successful. Um, limits on marketing to children, um, soda taxes, candy taxes, um, just a one cent per ounce soda tax in this country could decrease the rate of obesity dramatically and decrease health care costs probably upwards of 15 to 20 billion dollars a year. What about the anti-tax people? Are they going to go along with that suggestion? Well, taxes are the dues that you pay for living in a civilized society, and there are a number of taxes that nudge us in different directions and are used to benefit society as a whole. So if you're sure. talking about saving 17 billion dollars in health care costs, many of which come from those who have been obese lifelong, you're talking about Medicare, and you're talking often about people who are poor who are Medicaid, and that's basically government-sponsored health care, which is 
you and I. So we're actually going to be saving um, through those taxes, and those taxes will discourage consumption much as they have with teen smoking. Uh, and then um, there are some other measures, having a better farm bill that's not out there to promote meat and high fructose corn syrup and basically give subsidies to all the bad kind of foods and make the good kind of foods harder to afford and harder to find. Um, so there are a number of things you can do and one place you can find some articles that I've written on this topic as well as an open access PowerPoint that covers many of the, the items that Don and I went over today is, is on my website. Um, phsj.org or publichealthandsocialjustice.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're going to talk about your book. Come on. Yeah, I think my editor and, and, and my publicist, which makes me sound more important than I am, but I like saying that, <laughs> my publicist, would be um, uh, appalled if I didn't mention my book, which you can pre-order on the website. You can see the table of contents and you can read some of the endorsements. Um, this is a project that's been a passion of mine really for the last 10 years. And the book is called A Public Health and Social Justice Reader. And it consists of a number of articles that I have already written as well as a number of very well done articles that others have written that I found to be motivational for me, influential in my teaching, things that my students have particularly loved, as well as a lot of new material by me. And it's divided into sections. And so one of the sections looks at war and human rights. Another section looks at women's rights and reproductive health care and uh, obstacles to um, contraception and abortion, domestic violence. Another section looks at oh, it's the pretty whole, broad, huh? Yeah, the whole food system issue. Another section looks at gold and diamonds and floriculture and their effects on, on human rights and on the environment. Um, there's a section looking at the healthcare system. There's a section on the pharmaceutical industry. There's a section looking at marginalized populations, the LGBTs, the migrant and seasonal farm workers, uh, the Native Americans, African Americans. Um, I like to think that I've captured a broad scope of the topic of public health and social justice. And really, this is something that could be read by anyone. Um, it, it's not just a, a textbook for those in medical or public health school. It could be read by college students, by adults who are simply interested, even high school students. It's it readable, huh? It's, a, it's, it's absolutely readable. There's not a lot of fancy science terms. Um, okay. And if you're passionate about the health of the planet and yourself, uh, you will go out and buy my book. <laughs> and really, I'm not making much on this. I, yeah, the amount of money I'm going to make on this is, is going to amount to 1% um, uh, of, of a uh, you know, pretty good income, but n not extravagant income since I work part time. So in the final 30 seconds or so, what are you going to say to the viewers? Just generally uh, uh, that uh, a final message that would be useful for them Look into that camera and tell That's them. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> well, it's You're always used to it, pressure. Yeah, it's always a delight to come on with you, and and I want to thank you for the message that you bring to your viewers, and I think it's a message of hope. That I know some of the topics that we've covered have been quite depressing, mm -hmm. uh, and yet I think one of the reasons that both of us still do it is we see hope for. Our species, we see hope for our planet, for future generations, and we know the only way a better world is going to achieve, be achieved is if we all keep fighting, keep struggling, keep loving each other, and um, remember the things that make it all worthwhile, and that's the love that you share with people. And be nice to each other and hug a lot. You see, you're big on the show. You see what it does on my chest? Look at my chest. He's jumping. He's been working so out. Excited. <laughs> Let's have a few PSAs before we stop. And uh, I want to tell you about some important stuff. To get my show, uh, local broadcast schedule, go to my website, www.donbam.com, and click on Present Day Activities. And there will be a listing. Uh, oh, we're going to talk about getting my show on the web, uh, other parts of the country when you're watching this right now. Go to my website again and click on favorite links to learn how to have your local station uh, get my show to be broadcast from that local uh, facility.
Next PSA is the ACLU. I've heard on the news today a few people who are unhappy with the ACLU again. For me, the ACLU is fantastic, terrific. There are a few things they have voted on that I'm unhappy with them about, but generally speaking, without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be further in the tubes than they are right now. I have another one to get my shows broadcast with other stations. Okay, I talked about that a minute ago. Go to www.pegmedia.com. Dot org. I think we have one more to talk about public service. So we've got to end corporate personhood. Corporations having the power of persons is too critical and are damaging our whole democratic system in America. We want to amend the Constitution. Go to that website and learn how to support amending the Constitution so they can take our country back. Now, what else? Oh, I've got to say thank you for watching, and I really mean that. Thank you for watching. And remember, KFC, okay? Way. Not that KFC. You're not going to undo everything we just said. Not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Martin. Uh, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Is that okay? Works for me. Yeah. Be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you, too. Thank you. And you, too. And you, too. <laughs> Thanks again for watching, and good night.